Item number, SCP-034. Object class, safe. Special containment procedures. SCP-034 is to be kept in a secure room, with access granted only to level 4 personnel. SCP-034 itself will be kept in a locked case that is under 24-hour surveillance. When not in lab conditions, SCP-034's protective sheath cannot be removed under any circumstances. Any personnel in contact with SCP-034 must be placed under a 24-hour observation period, until their identities can be confirmed. Description SCP-034 is a primitive knife constructed out of pure obsidian. Tests reveal that SCP-034 is approximately 1,000 years old. Despite its crude method of construction and age, SCP-034 is still incredibly sharp and requires no maintenance to retain its edge. Expert analysis hypothesizes that SCP-034 may be of South American origin and that it may have been used in Native American rituals. Several accounts from Spanish conquistadors exploring the region support this hypothesis, with detailed writings on how priests would flay their victims alive with similar knives and wear their skin as a tribute to their gods. SCP-034 has the ability to allow its bearer to take on the appearance of another individual. If SCP-034 is used to cut a piece of flesh from a living individual, and that piece of flesh is placed against the skin of another individual, the second individual would take on not only the appearance, but all physical characteristics of the first individual. Testing has shown that the minimum amount of skin required can be as little as one square centimeter. However, testing has also revealed that the amount of time the transformation lasts is directly proportional to the amount of flesh used. The ratio of time the transformation lasts to flesh used has been measured at approximately one hour for every square centimeter used. Once the time limit is passed, the affected individual will revert to their original form. Analysis of SCP-034's ability shows that its method of mimicking another individual is nearly flawless. Not only does SCP-034 change its bear's physical appearance, but their actual physical attributes as well, including height, weight, muscle mass, bone density, hair growth, eyesight, strength, physical medical conditions, and even DNA. The only physical traits that are not carried over in the transformation process are wounds caused by SCP-034 itself. Subjects still retain their original personality and memories while transformed. Even though the process is nearly instantaneous, taking only a few seconds, human test subjects have described the transformation process as extremely painful. Subjects also may suffer psychological trauma, depending on the extent of their physical transformation. Side effects are especially serious if the subject takes on the appearance of a person with differing gender, or with wildly different physical attributes. However, in order to function properly, the individuals who have their flesh cut off by SCP-034 must still be biologically alive to maintain the transformation. Should the individual whose identity has been stolen expire, the effect immediately wears off. Further details may be found in Lab Report 034-A. Also. SCP-034 only appears to work on human subjects. Cross-species experiments with SCP-034 have resulted in data expunged. SCP-034 came into Foundation possession when an imposter disguised as Dr. attempted to infiltrate Site. The imposter was apprehended when authorities discovered the real Dr. tied up in his home, with a large portion of his right arm skinned. Further details may be found in Post-Interrogation Report 2211. Lab Report 034-A We've decided to test several scenarios, dealing with the limits of SCP-034's capabilities. Test 1 Sample taken from deceased human cadaver and applied to Subject D-452. There is no observable effect. Test 2 Sample taken from D-532 and applied to D-452. D-452 successfully mimics D-532's appearance. Upon termination of D-532, D-452 immediately reverts back to original form. Test 3. Sample taken from D-433 while under a medically induced coma and applied to subject D-452. D-452 successfully mimics D-433's appearance and manages to maintain the transformation and consciousness. Test 4. 
sample taken from a brain-dead medical patient who suffered a massive brain hemorrhage and applied to D-452. D-452 successfully mimics the patient's appearance, but immediately loses consciousness upon transformation. D-452 does not regain consciousness until the transformation period expires. D-452 retains no memory of the event. Test 5 Sample taken from D-625, who suffered a broken arm due to a confrontation with security staff. D-452 successfully mimics D-625's appearance, including the broken arm. D-452's broken arm is remended when the transformation period expires. Test 6 Sample taken from a terminally ill medical patient and applied to D-452. The patient's terminal illness was caused by an inherent genetic defect. D-452 successfully mimics the patient's appearance, as well as the patient's illness. Both the terminally ill patient and D-452 expire at the same time, after which D-452 reverts back to original form. Test 7. Sample taken from a chimpanzee and applied to D-466. D-466 experiences rapid growth of hair across their entire body. There are otherwise no other significant physical or physiological changes. Body hair disappears when the transformation period expires. Test 8. Sample taken from an Atlantic salmon and applied to D-466. There is no observable effect. Test 9. Under O5 authorization, a sample taken from SCP is applied to D-466. D-466 exhibits extremely adverse reaction upon transformation and data expunged, resulting in significant damage to testing environment, multiple injuries among test and security staff, and the death of D-466. Testing of anomalous humanoids with SCP-034 is suspended indefinitely. Post-Interrogation Report 2211 As per standard operating procedure, we first attempted to interrogate the prisoner via non-violent and non-invasive means. However, when such methods proved ineffective, we began to implement conventional interrogation techniques. While partially successful, we deemed it necessary to use SCP, 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 and SCP. We managed to learn the following facts. The prisoner had extensive knowledge on the existence of the Foundation and its inner workings. The prisoner had extensive knowledge on other SCP-related agencies and groups. The prisoner was not acting under any official capacity from any government agency. The prisoner obtained SCP-034 and instructions on its operation from an unknown benefactor. The prisoner was given very specific instructions to infiltrate Site and maintain his position until further notice. The prisoner had enough samples of Dr. to stay within sight for days. Regrettably, the prisoner did not survive interrogation. Agent Item Number SCP-044 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures A constant stream of hydrogen ions, unbound oxygen atoms, and other trace-free radicals emanate from the muzzle of SCP-044 at all times. Because of this, the docking stations of SCP-044 are to be well ventilated to keep dangerous gases and moisture from accumulating. Muzzle coverings are to be fitted at all times to keep birds and small animals from investigating the large open barrel of SCP-044. Addendum As SCP-044 has not been involved in any significant accidents in the years it has been held by the Foundation, SCP-044 has been reclassified as safe. Must I really define significant incidents? If containment procedures and standard safety protocols are followed, 44 appears to be no more dangerous than any other big gun. No, the bear incident does not count. 05 Description SCP-044 is a howitzer, secretly manufactured in the late stages of the Second World War by Krupp engineers, personally supervised by Albert Speer, German Minister of Armaments and War Production under Adolf Hitler. SCP-044 is unique not only because of its size, 251,000 kilograms or 251 metric tons, but also because it fires unconventional artillery using an atypical delivery method. Rather than having a breech for loading shells, the rear of the barrel is configured into a massive air compression chamber. 
Any object or pile of objects that fit may be loaded into SCP-044's muzzle to be used as ammunition. Because of its size, SCP-044 must remain rail-mounted and requires two freight locomotives to move. Researchers believe that SCP-044 weakens molecular and atomic bonds in any material loaded into its muzzle. However, the method by which SCP-044 affects molecular bonds is not known, due primarily to the numerous complex mechanisms that compose the housing and workings of SCP-044. In fact, some mechanisms appear useless and seem to do nothing other than spin or make noise even when SCP-044 is not supplied with power. Both equipment and personnel have been lost while exploring the inside of SCP-044's barrel. When SCP-044 is fired, all matter within its barrel is ejected at a high rate of speed as a glowing red slug, proportional in size to the amount of mass loaded into the muzzle. Upon striking a solid object or the ground, the slug explodes with a yield proportional to the mass of the original ammunition at no less than a percent mass to energy conversion rate. The yield will also increase somewhat the longer the slug remains in the barrel. The greatest known yield was achieved when the administrator's 8,900 kilogram or 19,500 pound personal diesel pickup truck was loaded in its entirety into the muzzle of SCP-044 and fired in the pictured experiment. Item number SCP-117 Object Class Safe Special Containment Procedures SCP-117 is to be kept in the small leather pouch it was found in, unless in use or in current study. Any personnel deemed mentally fit may enter the containment cell of the SCP, though if they are suspected to be trying to remove the SCP without permission, they are to be searched, and if that is the case, they are to be reprimanded. The door to the containment cell should remain locked, and a guard posted only when the object is in use. Description The item appears to be a regular multi-tool, of unknown make and brand, found in Florida. At first glance, only the normal tools are found – screwdriver, knife, can opener, etc. But if the user is faced with a task, regardless of what tool the subject intends to pull out and use, a tool perfectly fitted for the job will take its place, regardless of spatial quantities that are being broken by the tool. All other tools always seem to be present, though, after the task is completed and the tool closed, unless faced with a task requiring that tool again, the tool cannot be found on the tool again. Addendum Document Number 117A Effects of Usage After countless uses and testing with the SCP, it has been discovered to cause harm and possibly death to the user by means of absorbing iron, copper, calcium, and zinc from the user's body as long as the user is touching the device. Gloves seem to have no curbing effect on this, and the rate of absorption seems to depend on the tools used or created by SCP-117. It is advised that only Class D personnel are used in conjunction with this SCP to prevent death or injury of researchers. Document Number 117-B Usage Log of SCP-117 Redundant entries not entered, unless they exhibit different results. Situation: A loose screw on a metal plate. Tool produced by SCP. Screwdriver, though not the standard screwdriver. Situation: A nail, barely in piece of timber. Tool produced by SCP. Standard hammer. Situation: A piece of timber with proposed cut lines drawn. Tool produced by SCP. An electric saw, which needed no outside power source. Situation: a piece of bulletproof glass. Tool produced by SCP. An unknown laser cutting tool, which needed no outside power source. Situation. SCP. Tool produced by SCP. A bloodied combat knife. Situation. An agent with a broken bone. Tool produced by SCP. A small item with a trigger, which when pulled emitted an odd radiation, instantly healing the injury. Situation: Class D personnel fit for execution. Tool produced by SCP. Data expunged. Situation: Communication needed with SCP-363. Tool produced by SCP. Data expunged. Situation: A non-shuffled deck of playing cards. Tool produced by SCP. 
a mid-size mechanical shuffler. Situation. Class D personnel with terminal cancer. Tool produced by SCP. Item similar to sixth test. Situation. A perfectly healthy Caucasian human male with no criminal record. Tool produced by SCP. Data expunged. Situation. A perfectly healthy Hispanic human male with no criminal record. Tool produced by SCP. Data expunged. Situation. A silver dinner fork in perfect condition. Tool produced by SCP. No tools could be found on the SCP. Situation. Data expunged. Tool produced by SCP. A screwdriver. Situation. A dirty window. Tool produced by SCP. A nozzle that sprayed a mixture of soap and water that completely cleaned the window. Situation. An uncharged iPod. Tool produced by SCP. The iPod end of the charging cord, which needed no outside power source. Situation. A blank sheet of standard computer paper. Tool produced by SCP. A pen filled with a seemingly infinite supply of black ink. Situation. A Samsung cellular phone. Tool produced by SCP. A small device that when attached to the phone, increased signal strength by approximately 250%. Document number 117G. Developments concerning SCP-117. After exposing the SCP to an array of different items and people, it appears that the object may very well be sentient to some degree. Because of this, we must consider the fact that the SCP is susceptible to telepathy. It must not come into contact with any SCPs with known telepathic powers. Dr. Kleiman. The above was a transcript of the personal notes of Dr. Kleiman, who seems to have taken a harmless interest in the object. Testing with other SCPs is suspended. Note number 117-1. Testing is suggested for SCP-882 and is under consideration by Dr. Kleiman. Note number 117-2. Further biological testing is halted by Dr. Kleiman after incident number 117-4A. The SCP is still fit to be used for any repairs around the facilities, as long as the SCP is followed by one or more armed guards briefed on the proper use of the SCP. Note number 117-4. After much consideration, I must deny testing of SCP-117 with SCP-882. The risk of damaging SCP-882 is simply too great to overlook. Dr. Kleiman. Note number 117-26. After incident number 117-3F, I'm forced to put a stop to all testing of SCP-117 in conjunction with other SCPs. The risk of a total loss of containment is far too great. All biological testing is to be halted until a later date, as the results so far have proved varying, and there is a limit of Class D staff available for my research. Dr. Kleiman. Note number 11727. Biological testing resumed by Dr. Kleiman, with mixed results. Testing of SCP-117 with other SCPs under reconsideration by O5, though it seems unlikely further testing will occur. Note number 11728. Testing is suggested for SCP-682. Item number SCP-127. Object class. Safe. Special Containment Procedures SCP-127 is considered no more dangerous than a normal firearm of its type. However, due to its extraordinary properties, it is to be held in Weapons Locker 7C when not in use, and suspended in water rich in calcium and protein. At this time, only the research team assigned to SCP-127 has clearance to access it. Description: SCP-127, upon first glance, appears to be a standard MP5K submachine gun. Tests have revealed that aside from the outer steel shell, the entirety of the firearm is organic and alive. The weapon's ammunition initially appeared to be human-like teeth. However, DNA testing of the bullets resulted in no match to any known species on Earth. SCP-127 features two settings, semi-automatic and fully automatic. An audible groan can be heard when switching between the two. Upon depleting the weapon's magazine, typically 60 shots, it takes between 3 to 5 days to regrow a new supply of ammunition. Attempts to remove the magazine have resulted in failure. It seems to be permanently attached to the weapon. 
SCP-127 does not seem capable of reproduction at this time. Scans have shown no apparent reproductive organs, and requires no sustenance beyond water, calcium, and protein. SCP-127 was originally located in the house of a Mr. James who was found dead from a heart attack on the night of November 17, 1991. Coroner's reports state that Mr. died sometime in the morning of November 8th, but was not noticed missing until more than a week later. No complications or unusual circumstances were found to lead to his death. Due to his extensive gun collection, the ATF and FBI were notified to collect his weapons. SCP-127 was discovered during testing and cataloging, and was promptly collected by SCP agents. Addendum Reclassified as safe in 1990 Item Number SCP-154 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures SCP-154 is to be kept within Weapon Locker 8 in Armed Research Site 47. Personnel wishing to research or use item must submit the required request forms. Anyone attempting to remove the item without clearance or from outside the facility is to be terminated on site. Description SCP-154 is a pair of simple bronze bracelets, completely circular and large enough to comfortably hang off the arm of most people. Spectrograph analysis has proven that the item is composed entirely of copper, 85%, tin, 11%, arsenic, 3%, and traces of other slight impurities, less than 1%. When both bracelets are worn on the same arm, and the wearer concentrates on them with arms extended in a depiction of a traditional knocked bowstring pose, achieved by having the arm with the bracelets completely extended in front of oneself, with the opposing arm extended up to the elbow of the fully extended arm. A large, indistinct, incorporeal bow will form in the extended hand, and both bracelets will glow slightly. From that point onwards, SCP-154 can be treated as a bow, until the pose or concentration is broken, which results in the bracelets reverting to normal. There is no actual bowstring, but completing the motion of pulling it achieves the same effect. When the bowstring is pulled and released, the bones of the arm will be forcibly ejected from the extended limb, traveling in a straight path at speeds recorded over 300 meters per second. The missing bones and resulting damage to the arm are quickly regenerated, and the weapon is capable of being fired again within minutes. Tests using subjects possessing multiple arms and hands, such as SCP-1884-B, have demonstrated the ability to fire SCP-154 several times with the bones of different arms being used with each successive firing. The regeneration implemented by the item is limited, only affecting the damage inflicted by the weapon itself. This regeneration seems to be an automatic action, and will continue in almost all situations. Both firing the weapon and the resulting regeneration are understandably painful, and participants which have used the item once are generally disinclined to repeat usage. However, there have been found to be some occasional abnormalities regarding the regeneration. Most often, this manifests simply as minor mutations of the original subject, such as changes in size, pigmentation, and structure of the original organelles. These are an uncommon occurrence, capable of happening during any use of the weapon, though generally tend to occur during repeat usage. There are more drastic abnormalities, though these are much rarer and coincide with highly frequent use. These mutations can range from anything such as the growth of extra joints and digits in the affected arm, to a complete change of the chemical or physical structure of the limb. One test subject unknowingly had the bone matter within his arm converted into an unstable explosive compound, only discovering the fact when it detonated, causing two fatalities and three casualties. Another had the entire bone and musculature structure morphed into fully functional serpentine physiology. Item Number SCP-186 Object Class Euclid Special Containment Procedures The site of SCP-186, comprising an approximately 300 kilometers squared area, is to be closed to the public under the auspices of a habitat restoration initiative for the European bison. An automated security perimeter is to be established, 
monitored by staff at Remote Site 355. Security personnel must patrol SCP-186 every two weeks. Any anomalous phenomena observed within the security perimeter must be documented and reported to the research director. All known primary sources documenting the events of SCP-186 have been secured by the Foundation. These materials are to be stored in the Site-23 archives. Due to the age of the materials and the potential for deterioration, all access to these documents must be approved by the Site-23 archivist and handled per their instructions. All instances of SCP-186-1 are to be secured in the munitions wing of Site-23. Description SCP-186 is the site of an unrecorded military engagement occurring from 7-24-1917 to 8-13-1917 between elements of the Imperial German Army and forces of the Russian Provisional Government as part of the larger conflict of World War I and the continuing effects resulting from its aftermath. This conflict came to be known to its participants as the Battle of Husiatine Woods in surviving accounts. In July of 1917, an armed engagement between a detachment of approximately 500 German soldiers and the remnants of a Russian division scattered during the German counterattack to the Kerensky Offensive took place at the location of SCP-186. The forces met in heavily forested terrain outside the town of Husiatin in what is currently Ternopil Oblast, Ukraine. On both sides of the conflict, combatants deployed anomalous weaponry utilizing technology that is yet to be duplicated or understood at present. This battle eventually resulted in the deaths or permanent incapacitation of all forces involved and approximately 300 civilians in its general vicinity. SCP-186-1 consists of recovered weaponry dating from the initial containment of SCP-186 in 1917 and includes the following a highly modified weapon resembling the Skoda M1909 machine gun, capable of causing extremely rapid tumor-like growths to appear within the body of any organism larger than a common lab rat. Mortar shells, specially designed to be fired from a Mortier de 58mm Type II, containing a gas that causes animal cells to become unable to cease life function. Concertina wire, coated with an unknown hallucinogenic compound, that permanently affects human test subjects upon entering the bloodstream. Remnants of an unknown incendiary device, believed to have been detonated at the close of the conflict, accounting for what is estimated to be 34% of total casualties. British Empire Issue No. 27 Type Grenades, containing a gas capable of passing through all tested gas mask filtration systems and causing humans to constantly experience the sensation of being on fire. 8x50mm rimmed French rifle cartridges, containing powdered human bone instead of gunpowder. Purpose unknown. Historical records indicate that the German detachment involved in the Battle of Husiatin Woods, at the behest of a Hungarian military advisor named Matthias Nemes, specifically pursued the group of Russian forces in retreat, which at the time included French scientist Dr. Jean Durand. Based on documents of the era since suppressed by the Foundation, it is believed that these two individuals are responsible for the development and limited manufacture of SCP-186-1 and had attached themselves to opposing sides of the Eastern Front for the express purpose of deployment of these weapons in a combat setting. Research Log 186-7 Notable Anomalies Documented at SCP-186 04-11-1923 a 3 km squared area in the southwestern portion of SCP-186 experiences a spontaneous die-off of trees. Decomposition occurs on an extremely accelerated time scale, and area is completely cleared of trees and other plant life within two weeks. 01-13-1927 Despite temperatures consistently at negative 15 degrees Celsius, no snow is visible throughout central portion of site. Temperatures measured at site are consistent with surroundings. 09-02, 1932. The sounds of sporadic gunfire are recorded throughout the site, despite lack of observed presence of any civilians. Sounds persist for three days. 05-30, 1936. 
Agents Chekhov and fail to return from routine patrol of SCP-186. No subsequent traces of either person are ever recovered. 0515-1941 Acting in accordance with intelligence sources embedded in the Third Reich, Foundation personnel evacuate SCP-186 in advance of Operation Barbarossa. Subsequent to decommissioning observation posts, faint glow visible from 150 meters documented by staff to move through sight. Definitive visual contact unestablished prior to evacuation. 10-29-1945 Containment of SCP-186 re-established after discussions with Soviet Union officials. Upon initial patrol after re-establishment of containment, 13 corpses dressed in uniforms and insignia of the German 4th Panzer Army and 27 corpses in Soviet 22nd Army uniforms are discovered in advanced state of decay. No identifications of personnel are successful, as all identifying documents and insignia have been removed prior to Foundation containment. 02 1959 Following the formation of a large sinkhole in the northeastern portion of SCP-186, four men are observed wandering the immediate area in a state of extreme disorientation, dressed in what are later identified to be severely decomposed and degraded World War I-era military uniforms of both German Empire and Russian issue. Subjects detained and routed to Site-23 for subsequent research. 04-02-1959 After an extensive excavation of the site of the northeastern sinkhole, 23 persons are discovered buried at a depth of 15 meters in a mass grave, alive despite decades of internment and various wounds and injuries. As with subjects discovered earlier, most are dressed in remnants of military uniforms of the World War I era and are presumed to be participants in the original SCP-186 event. Extensive research at Site-23 yields little information, as subjects are unable to provide any meaningful information or communication to Foundation staff due to extensive psychological trauma and profound mental disorders. Foundation staff attempt to euthanize subjects after three weeks of research, but fail in all attempts. Subjects subsequently tranquilized, anesthetized, and incinerated. 07-29-1962 Prior to upgrades to containment facilities, security perimeter of SCP-186 found to be almost 85 meters longer than originally documented. Inquiry later rules out clerical error as source of discrepancy. 12-13-1975 Localized weather phenomena documented as occurring entirely and exclusively within SCP-186. These include sustained winds up to 120 km per hour, 20 centimeters of rainfall, and temperatures temporarily reaching 48 degrees Celsius. 08-12-1987 Packs of wolves, numbering an estimated 200 total individuals, travel to SCP-186 mass at a point in the central region of the site and immediately disperse. 03-03-2009 A stand of three spruce trees is observed in the southwestern deforested area, the first documented plant life since 1923 event. Estimated age of trees is 50 years. Transcripts of selected SCP-186 documents. Document 186-3 a flyer advertising a May 1911 lecture given by Dr. Durand to the Royal Institute of Chemistry. To end all wars. A presentation by visiting scholar Dr. Jean Durand, formerly of the Academy des Sciences, on the promise of modern science to create weapons of such terrible deterrent power so as to render future wars obsolete. Dr. Durand shall explain in the convergence of chemistry, ballistics, alienism, and other emerging scientific fields of endeavor that will enable mankind to usher in a new age of peace and modernity. To be given on the 19th of May, Derbyshire Lecture Hall. Document 186-11, opinion piece published in the January 2nd, 1912 edition of the Hungarian newspaper, Nepsava, authored by Matthias Nemes. To my fellow subjects of His Highness Emperor Franz Joseph, truly, 
the greatest of human glories is the unification of a numerous and disparate people into a single, unstoppable purpose. That our marvelous kingdom should embody this inescapable principle should go without saying from Vienna to Budapest. But there are those, both within our territories and elsewhere on the continent, that would see us splintered into a thousand shards and stand in the way of our destiny. What is to be done with such agitators and malcontents? While traitors and radicals are hung properly in the manner of the dogs that they are, there is no execution sufficient to quell the embers of treachery that burn in the hearts of the Balkanites. How are we to demonstrate our unity of purpose, our power, our God-given place at the head of the European procession? By force of arms. The hangman can only strike fear into the heart of dozens. A proper army can strike it into the souls of millions. Perhaps we have the numbers, but in this we are not alone. The Russian and the Muslim can rally hordes to their banners, but for all of their masses are merely unruly nuisances. What sets man apart from the animals is not his numerical superiority. No, but his superiority of mind, demonstrated through quick wit and artifice. My fellow subjects, I have dedicated my life to the construction of such demonstrations of artifice that none may stand against my weapons, save the Almighty. It is through the force of superior arms that we will achieve our grand design, both within our borders and without. Give me the factories. Give me the manpower. Give me the chance to serve our empire through my industries. And I will deliver to the people the flaming sword that will light the way to a civilized Europe. It is through these means, and only these means, that we will solve the questions that plague us today. Document 186-32 Telegram sent by Jean Durand to Matthias Nemes from Paris, April 28th, 1912 Have considered your proposal. Must decline. Methods inferior and derivative of own research. Your aims are of conquest. Mine are of peace. Regards, J. Durand Documents 186-39 Undated memorandum from General Felix Graf von Bothmer of the Imperial German Army to unnamed subordinates. Effective immediately, Lieutenant Nemes is assigned to your unit as an advisor. Experimental armaments are only to be deployed on Lieutenant Nemes's orders. Despite potential for a breakthrough on the Romanian front, unwise to use these ungodly things until more is known of their efficacy. Rumors of similar developments among the Tsarists remain unsubstantiated. Document 186-52 Letter from Private Pyotr Avtakov, participant in the Battle of Husiatine Woods. Dearest Nadia, I have heard rumors of the madness happening at home. Be comforted that it is nothing like the madness that is happening here. We thought that four years of war had taught us everything we had to know and then more. We learned nothing. The damnable Frenchman that the men elected to lead them spoke of peace. He spoke of weapons so terrible that we could make the enemy surrender on the spot. We were fools. We had run at the trenches with dead men's rifles and sticks in our hands. We believed him, the way we believed anyone that has supplies. We never thought where this man came from. We didn't wonder why he had the weapons he did. We didn't care. We wanted to live. We never considered that the enemy had the same things we did. I do not think the Frenchman did either. Or at least... I hope he did not. I cannot imagine any man who would walk into this knowing what would happen. Maybe the Frenchman is not a man. Maybe he is something else. I am sitting now in a hole I have dug in a forest somewhere. I should have run the second I saw the German take aim at Gilyov. That was no bullet fired at him. I could not look anymore after his face came apart, and he was still screaming. I thought I saw hands pulling his head apart. Somewhere in the distance, Volikov is screaming that he can see devils roasting his children. He has been screaming about the same thing for five days. I should have run away so many times. The Frenchman gave us a new gas weapon. We refused at first, remembering what had happened in Romania. But he promised us that this was different, that this would put our enemies down without harming them. Who wants any more bloodshed? He asked us. We could not argue with that. We fired mortars at a position ahead of us. A strange blue gas seeped from behind the trees, but the Frenchman cautioned us against advancing. 
One more thing, he said. He took one of our rifles, and taking aim, took a single shot. Before we could ask what a scientist could know of shooting, we heard a scream. He had hit one of the Germans. He handed me a pair of field glasses. Take a look, he said. I saw the German missing half of his head, still screaming. I have seen everything in this war, but I have never seen faces like those of that German's fellows as they watched their comrade. The Frenchman, in his terrible calm voice, explained that his shot had to have destroyed at least a quarter of the soldier's brain tissue. Enough to cause instant death, he said. But watch. I kept watching through the field glasses. The German didn't stop screaming. At least ten minutes I watched, unable to move away. The Frenchman smiled. He smiled at this scene. The gas, he said, ensured that death would not come, regardless of injury. The Germans were too horrified by their comrade to notice that they were not behind cover, and the Frenchman lined up another shot. The rest of the soldier's head was now gone, and the screaming was replaced by some sort of low grunting, the likes of which I have never heard from men. No, the Frenchman said, no harm at all. I have bestowed the gift of life on your opponents. Who could possibly stand against that? He asked. I had to leave and vomit behind some bushes. I had not done that since the first trenches. Who indeed could keep fighting after such a thing? But fight they did. Once, a group of us were ambushed and chased to a meadow. The first men through the trees were hit with something that took their skin. I cannot describe why seeing men blown apart is not as frightening as seeing a neatly flayed corpse on a battlefield, but our group scattered. We are no longer armies. Not anymore. We are animals. Trapped in a forest together, uncomprehending. Sometimes, when Volokhov sleeps, I hear the Frenchman in the woods, yelling in Hungarian, yelling and laughing. I would almost rather listen to Volokhov. I am going to die in this hole. I am too scared of what is outside of it to do otherwise. Minkin is going to try to brave the horrors in the woods to escape. I am sending this letter with him, in the hopes that he does. As I gave it to him, he joked that he will get a civil service commission after the war for delivering a letter from hell. I'm not certain he is wrong. Goodbye, Pyotr. Lesson complete. To continue with your orientation training, subscribe to SCP Orientation right now and make sure you don't miss any of our upcoming videos.